watchers in the fourth dimension. We turned that whole planet into a piece of Gruyere cheese between us. His companions were in a state of some anxiety concerning his present whereabouts. Pack up! Hello and welcome to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension. I'm Anthony. I'm Don. I'm Julie. And I'm Riley. And this episode, it's time for our Season 6 retrospective, where we will look back on the season with our usual blend of qualitative award-style categories and also some quantitative measures. But before we get into that, we're going to shake things up a little and move our mail up to the front of the episode. If you're not already aware, we record a little ahead of our release schedule. So at this time, while we are recording this, our episode on The Seeds of Death was the most recently released. So these comments mostly relate to that. Firstly, we had a number of people talk about owning this as one of the earliest stories that they had on VHS. I believe it was the fifth serial that was released. It was good to hear from David Campbell and Nathan Laws on Facebook on that point, along with Paul Arthur, also known as Doctor Who 60s, 70s, 80s on Instagram. There was a lot more from David on how this story really is different when you watch it as a child to when you watch it in adulthood. Having nostalgic memories makes it a lot harder to be objective. I wish I had the time to read everything from David. It was a long post, but he had a lot of really great thoughts on this story. So if you're interested, go check them out on Facebook. Nathan also commented to say that he was surprised that we didn't talk more about how awesome Miss Kelly was through this. I thought we did that. Me too, but it all blends together after a certain point. <laughs> I certainly recall talking about how fantastic she and Zoe were together. In fact, I think I used the phrase badass, but <laughs> moving on. A number of people also expressed their love of the serial. Paul Heddington, Terry Kappelman, and Jamie Stilinovich. Jamie, I apologise if I butchered your last name. We hear you, and that was definitely a serial that we all enjoyed. Terry also talked about how much the Ice Warriors scared him when he was a child, a sentiment also shared by Peter Crouch. Peter, if you're still listening in, thank you for all the goals you scored for the England footy team. Oh wait, that was a different Peter Crouch? I was about to say. Well, thank you for commenting on our Facebook page regardless. Jeff Waddell let us know how much he appreciated us referring to the Ice Warriors as the Arse Warriors, <laughs> something that Paul Arthur also commented on, and Paul made a little comment about Don respecting their British heritage. So, Don, <laughs> good job. You're welcome, fandom. <laughs> <laughs> Ishmael Sykes definitely wins the award for best comment, and it's the only one I'm going to read in its entirety. So verbatim, he stated, I don't get TMAT. I think it's one of those ideas that seems like such a good idea at the outset, but very quickly turns out to be a massive Swiss cheese. And at that point, you can either turn every energy over to carrying the bloody great Swiss cheese, unwieldy and full of holes as it is, or you can make fondue and next morning get up and start again. Ishmael, you're an absolute legend, mate, and we hope that your days are full of fondue and not Swiss cheese. Yes. Over on Instagram, we asked the question of whether people preferred the Ice Warriors or the Seeds of Death, and feedback was pretty much resoundingly in favour of the latter. So thank you, Terry Fedora, Longshank Rascal Cosplay, Insta Brabin, Paul Arthur again, and Classic Who fan page. Finally, Nick Rutherford dropped us an email to say that it's been a year since he discovered our show and that he looks forward to the show arriving every couple of weeks and that listening in is making him rewatch episodes that he hasn't watched for years and reevaluate some of his long held opinions. Nick, thank you for your email, and I'm glad that we're helping you rewatch and reevaluate the Troughton era. It was really quite the bumper amount of correspondence this week. So if you would like to send us a message, we do like to read them out. You can comment on our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter pages where we can be found at at Watchers4D. Or you can drop us an email at Watchers4D at gmail.com. And if you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and leave us a review on your favourite podcasting app. With that out of the way, and once again, thank you everyone for reaching out, we will move into our Season 6 retrospective. For each of our categories, we will move in reverse alphabetical order, so Riley will answer first, followed by Julie, then Don, and then myself. With that, we will start with best and worst stories, and just as a reminder, our options for this are The Dominators, The Mind Robber, The Invasion, The Crotons, The Seeds of Death, The Space Pirates, and The War Games. Riley, over to you. Best story for me is The Mind Robber. It's just so much fun. It's experimental. There's always something new happening from scene to scene. The visuals are interesting about the entire time of the run of the serial. The story does contain a wee little bit of darkness, which makes it that much more exciting. And you can see the TARDIS crew getting really disjointed and challenged by what's being put in front of them. Worst story for me 
is obviously the Space Pirates. <laughs> terrible script, terrible characters. It really does feel like it got thrown together quickly at a meeting. You know, just how about pirates in space? Yes, let's do that. You know what? Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah. All right, Julie, how about you? Uh, so this is actually really hard for me because honestly, there were two stories that were in the lead and two stories that were in last. But since I feel like the mind robber is going to get a lot of love, I'm going to give it to the war games because I think that they went in wanting to make something epic. They made something epic that wasn't slow. The 10 episodes all made sense, and it was on such a large scale, and I think they pulled it off. So I really enjoyed the War Games, and plus that is the end of an era, and I thought they handled that end pretty well. Some of the visuals were a little weird at the very, very end, but it all worked. And where story, I am going to agree though, it is the Space Pirates. The Dominators had more potential than the Space Pirates ever did. If they had mixed up a few things, the Dominators could have worked. Space Pirates, they would have had to scrap it entirely and come up with a brand new plot with brand new characters. So it was worse. Fair enough. I don't think you're going to get a lot of argument from any of us on that. <laughs> Don, how about you? I had a tough time with the best story because for once it was almost a three-way tie between the Mind Robber, the Invasion, and the War Games because they were all very good stories that still hold up to this day. I finally decided to go with the mind robber because it's so inventive and crazy and it's got a pretty good pace to it at only five episodes. As for the worst story, I'm going to veer slightly off and I'm going to have to say the dominators mm -hmm. because it's the space pirates is bad. I think it could have been improved, but they were trying to move our crew to work on the war games, and it is what it is. The script of the Dominators just kind of offended me in some of its stupidity. <laughs> it's more fun once you view them, the two Dominator characters, as in a relationship, and each one thinks they're the Dom. <laughs> then it's kind of fun. <laughs> really, they're just both power bottoms. Really, yes. <laughs> and it just doesn't work. That's fair. All right. In terms of favorite story, I agree. There really is a three-way tie between The Mind Robber, The Invasion, and The War Games. All three are wonderful stories. This season really oscillates between amazing and terrible, and the highs are really, really high. I think between the three, I'm going to have to go with Riley and Don and say The Mind Robber. As I said at the time, there's so much childhood nostalgia behind that one, and it's one of the first stories that really captured my imagination. And as a result, I think I've got to say that it's the first story I gave 10 out of 10 to. It's the only story I've given 10 out of 10 to so far. So for me, it's the mind robber. In terms of least favorite story, again, it's a toss up between the Dominators and the Space Pirates. I think they are honestly two of the worst stories we've seen in the entire show so far. And I know I rated the Space Pirates lower, but I think in retrospect, I'm going to give the Space Pirates a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, given that there are five episodes missing, and join Don in The Dominators. Just not good, guys, and certainly not good as a season opener. So those are my choices. Okay, next up, we have best and worst moment, and we don't have a short list for this, so it can literally be anything from the entirety of the season for those two. So Riley, we will start with you. It seems to be very common tonight. It's a tie. I don't know I don't know why, but I keep coming back to that moment in the beginning of the invasion where the crew meet up with that driver and they see the International Electromatics compound. It's such a great start to a serial because there's this tremendous feeling of creepiness and it just stuck with me. It, it just sets the tone really, really well. Also, I guess I really like the horror moments or the creepy moments. The other one that I enjoyed was the portion of the mind robber while Jamie and Zoe were outside of the TARDIS in the beginning in limbo and the doctor was being psychologically or psych psychically, excuse me, psychically messed with in the TARDIS. And we have this amazing shot that after we hear this like blood curdling scream, we have an immediate cut to Jamie and Zoe dressed completely in white. And it was just so striking and just eerie. Where they're motioning to the doctor, like, come mm -hmm. out here. I think yeah, the, the yeah. scream was actually put over that. So you get the scream right, with them right. smiling in yeah. Yeah, all in white. That was, yeah, that was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And worst moment? Uh, no surprise for me. The introduction of Milo, the costume, the giant <laughs> mustache, the singing, the horrible accent, the painful attempts at comedy. Once he entered the screen, the entire serial was doomed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Okay, Julie, you're up. 
So I'm going to go with, with two things for best moment just because, you know, one's going to be very obvious because one of my best moments was when the real Jamie comes back in the mind robber. Uh, <laughs> because you know me, but I really enjoyed that whole stint where in order to make up for Fraser Hines being sick for the one week in replacing him with the putting together Jamie's face and him doing it wrong the first time and the doctor fixing it and doing it right the next time. The whole bit was clever, but obviously I was really excited when Jamie comes back because Jamie's my favorite. And then the other one also comes from the mind robber and it's anytime Gulliver was on screen. <laughs> Because I love him and I just thought that having him as a character and having him only say words that were written in the book was a phenomenal idea and I loved it. All right. And worst moment? The random ass reference to Gruyere cheese in the Space Pirates because (laughs) why? (laughs) Even Jamie in the script was like, Gruyere cheese? Like questioning why that was even brought up. So that's it. There, There was no reason for it and the Space Pirates was just bad. Fair. Done. I like the fact that I've blocked out any mention of green or cheese for no apparent reason. <laughs> any of the above could have been my best moment, and if you talk to me tomorrow, it might be. But the one I like is a smaller moment. It's in the invasion, and it's when the doctor and company are in this room, and the doctor sees a camera, and he casually screws it up with, I believe it's a magnet. And Vaughn just casually comes in and fixes it, doesn't get upset at all. He's just the coolest. I love that. My worst moment is for once a a special effect moment. I believe it occurred in the Crotons where they show the the model city. (laughs) And I swear if they hadn't said, oh, look, it's a city, I would not have known what I was supposed to be looking at. (laughs) Like, oh, look, a rock with some holes in it. Yeah. Not done well. Not the best. And I, I don't like picking on Old Who for special effects because they went really far with a really, really tiny budget. But in that one instance, I'm like, no, no, that's just not working for me. I think we even said it when we did the Crotons. You know, we know that Doctor Who at this time can do so much better than that. And we saw it doing that back in season one. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's unfairly ragging on the effects because you are still looking at it in the context of the time. All right, that leads it to me. And I have, like Riley and Julie, two moments for best moment. One from the invasion and one from the mind robber. So I'll start with the mind robber because it's a bit more of a bombastic scene. And that's the fiction off between the doctor (laughs) and the master, where they're one-upping each other with different fictional characters. And you've got the carcass with his laser and he brings in D'Artagnan and, you know, the Dread Pirate Roberts and whomever else. (laughs) (laughs) I realised that The Princess Bride had not been recorded at this stage, but you get my point. Point. And then the other one was that wonderful moment where in the invasion, they're getting in the car with Vaughn and Jamie scoots across the back seat, gets out <laughs> yes. and beats Packer into the front seat because that's just wonderful. And that look of annoyance on Packer's face, the smug look on Jamie's face, that was just such a wonderful comic beat. And yep. I loved it. In terms of worst moment, I mean, it's very difficult not to just say the entirety of the Dominators or the entirety of the Space Pirates. <laughs> So I'm actually going to be a bit more nuanced. It is going to be to do with the Dominators, but not the entirety of it. And I think that's how they completely misjudged the tone. Again, we talked about it at the time. It was meant to be a story that was kind of a parody and some satire on the peace movements. I think given that it was going out at literally the same time that people were being beaten in the streets at the DNC, read the room, guys. It just didn't (laughs) work for that reason. So that's my choice for worst moment was really the tone and feel of that story. Next up, we have best lead actor. So that is one of our TARDIS regulars. So our options are Patrick Troughton as the Doctor, Fraser Hines as Jamie, and Wendy Padbury as Zoe. Riley, we will start with you. This is a tough one because this is their last season for all of them. I enjoyed all of them. And I decided that I would select whoever hadn't been selected by anyone else, but I'm going first. (laughs) So... So Riley will travel back in time after we've all answered <laughs> places. Oh. So I'm going to guess, and I will cover the, all the bases, and I'm going to go with the Wendy Padbury. When I think about her, I think specifically about that scene in the Crotons where she solved the computer puzzle that the Doctor has difficulty with. The back and forth they had was really quite wonderful and delightful. And, you know, we always talk on this podcast about Heinz and Troughton, their chemistry and how good it is. But you know what? Trout and Padbury, they had pretty good chemistry, too. They had some scenes that they really played off each other really well, and I think that was one of them. All right. That's fair. Julie. 
All right, guys. This one will come as no surprise. Remember last time I did go with Patrick Troughton, so it's not like I choose Fraser every time, but we are going to go with Fraser Hines this time. <gasps> <laughs> Yes, I know. Yes, my love of Jamie knows no bounds, but I actually do think that he did a really good job this season, especially considering he was thinking about leaving for such a long time and decided to stay, but that didn't really bleed through at all, in my opinion. Um, There was one story where he didn't get a lot of time, but I think that was just because of rewrites and them just, you know, not being able to get him back in. But really like some of the moments... Um, especially where they kept on going on and on about the doctor and Zoe being intelligent, but Jamie got to play the, well, they might be in, you know, book smart, but I have all the street smarts and I loved all of those moments that he had when he's convincing uh, the Crotons to tell them the, their entire plot. Um, and he's just like, yeah, this is great. Like, keep telling, keep, t- keep telling me more. So I just think he did a really fantastic job and I'm so glad that he stuck around to the end uh, to complete his time with Patrick Troughton. Somehow we kind of guessed you might head in that direction in Jamie's last season. You know, it's what I do. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Don, your choice on best lead actor. Unofficially, it's a three-way tie. Mm -hmm. I love the way they all work together. It's a really good TARDIS team, and I'm glad that they left together. But much like Riley, this time I wanted to give someone that hasn't really had their praises sung enough, and that was... Wendy Padbury, because that character, I think, could have been really tough to do. I like the fact that she didn't fall into the peril monkey trope, but she didn't have that annoying smart character thing that happens too often Mm -hmm. where they're just Mm -hmm. insufferable. Mm -hmm. She was fun and Jamie and and her, they could tease each other and, you know, tease with the doctor. Mm -hmm. It was just a really good chemistry. I'm, I'm really glad she was there in this season. Yeah. I'm in agreement. Unofficially, for me, this is a three-way tie. It's very difficult to pick one. I almost want to say Patrick Troughton to give him at least one mention here, but I think my heart is in the same place as Riley and Don. I think I've got to say Wendy Padbury. Don, you expressed all the reasons perfectly. They didn't make her annoying. They stayed true to her character. And Wendy Padbury really pulled it off. She made the character charming and fun, and yet still obviously smart. She was just phenomenal. But again, for me, this is probably the best TARDIS crew we've had since the first Doctor, Ian, Barbara and Vicky. So it's a very yeah. hard choice mm-hmm. to kind of split them up in that way and pick just one of them. But Wendy Padbury just about pulls it off for me. So when I said that I picked her because I didn't think anyone else would, I really yeah. made a huge mistake. Then, didn't I? <laughs> you should have gone for Trout indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next up, we have Best Supporting Actor. So for that definition, that is anyone who is not one of the three leads. It can be a one-line person, it can be a major villain. In general, whomever else you want to give your nomination to as Best Supporting Actor. Again, Riley, we start with you. I'm going to go with Terry Scully as Fushim in The Seeds of Death. Mm. How he pitifully said, I want to live his general wimpiness followed by his redemption arc. I usually don't like that type of cowardly character because I feel like it's usually played up too much, but I don't know. He did such a great job with it. And he has a character that gets to show so much range because then he does conquer his cowardice at the very, very end. So I'm picking him. I found him to be very interesting in the season of death, and I think he really held those scenes together when he had to play off of people that were hissing at him the entire time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. Okay, Julie. All right, I'm going to be quick. I do have two because I like these characters for totally different reasons. I already mentioned them once, but Bernard Horsfall for Gulliver, because while it was like a weird thing in The Mind Robber, it's very easy for it to have been really weird and him to sound really out of place. But they were able to find sentences and phrases that actually worked within the story. Um, But then my other was David Seville with Lieutenant Carstairs Mm. for Mm. once having someone who is not going to be a recurring character, was not in charge, but was just a very competent character, listened to the TARDIS crew and stuck with them the entire time. I just really enjoyed his character. Nice. Don. That's very good. I've really enjoyed these choices so far. I'm doing a tie of, to me, what were the, the heavy hitters of this season? Number one, Kevin Stoney. For obvious reasons, because my God, the man just walks into a scene and just, (laughs) he even manages to diminish Trouton a little bit. And that's saying something. And tied with that is Mr. 
face for all seasons philip maddock who showed up twice looking completely different <laughs> being great but with a special mention much like julie did of bernard horsfell who had his, yep. his great character of gulliver and also shows up as one of the time lords in the final episode and he just has mm -hmm. that great voice mm -hmm. <laughs> yes he does so damn you don <laughs> you've stolen my choices <laughs> <laughs> I was torn between Kevin Stoney for exactly the same reason. He steals every goddamn scene that he's in. You know, he comes in, he chews the scenery in the best of ways. And then Philip Maddock. I don't really care about his role in the Crotons, but in the war games, he comes in and he's got that wonderful, cool, calm, collected demeanor. When he loses it, you know he's really losing it. And he's just fantastic. So Don, you and I, complete agreement. Mm-hmm. Wish I had something different to say, because I think that makes <laughs> things a bit more interesting. But my heart is with those two. For our next one, we have Best and Worst Villains. And again, I'm going to give you the nominations here, because there are a few. So in The Dominators, we have The Dominators and The Quarks. In The Mind Rubber, we have The Master Brain. In The Invasion, Tobias Vaughn and The Cybermen. In The Crotons, we have The Crotons. That's not particularly inventive. <laughs> In The Seeds of Death, we have the Ice Warriors. In The Space Pirates, we have Cavern. And then in The War Games, we have the War Chief, the Warlord, and the Security Chief, plus the other associated people of the Warlord's race. So, Riley, over to you. Best and worst out of that lot. Best villain. Let me tell you a little bit about the Quarks. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. <laughs> You know what I'm going to say. I'm talking about the OG ice cold T Vaughn. This guy has taste. He has not one, not one, but two swank ass offices with appropriate cocktail lounge music. His heart rate never gets over 50. He is super intelligent and he does not dilly dally. He cuts right to the chase and nobody says Packer like him. And when he realizes his plans are ruined, does he help the doctor to save humanity? No, he does it just to spite the Cybermen. A true bastard through and through. <laughs> nice. And for your choice on worst villain. Uh, uh, Coven, uh, Space Pirates. <laughs> Confusing plan. Tactics are moronic. His screen presence is abysmal, even though he's wearing Darth Helmet's helmet. <laughs> Some may pick the Dominators, but like I, I will say that Quarks are cute. They have character and the Dominators have an interesting BDSM thing going on that Don mentioned. So that's interesting and entertaining. <laughs> but Coven, other than uh, he has nothing memorable. The only thing I can remember with him is that he said the cliched line, anybody else want to die like a hero really well. And that's it. <laughs> Fair. So generally unmemorable character. Yes. Okay, Julie, best and worst of that lot. Yeah, so I'm not going to be quite as entertaining as Riley was. So for best villain, I'm actually going to go with the Warlord. Just him, specifically. Because what I liked about him is, again, he wasn't the overbearing boss that we've gotten so many times. He's calm, collected. He has a plan, and he sticks with it. And then when he finds out more information, he shifts plan when he needs to. And he's, he stood up for himself and tried to the very end to keep his life and to keep winning. So I thought that was a really good villain because we don't necessarily see that all the time. And the facial hair. Like, oh, that man, it was on point. The worst villain is the Quarks because they shouldn't have never been a villain. They should be a happy robot. <laughs> and yeah, they're the worst villain because they shouldn't be one. All right, that <laughs> checks out. Done. Over to you. I personally think that anything in the Tobias, Vaughn, and the Cybermen discography <laughs> stands up right against the likes of Hawkwood and Pink Floyd in terms of space rock. <laughs> They're just awesome. And yes, he is the best villain, in my opinion, although I think the Warlord came pretty close. The worst is obvious, and Julie called it out. The quirks are terrible. That is not a <laughs> villain design. It's barely a character design. And the fact Aww. that they held up all this deal so they thought they were going to get all the money from these characters they had created <laughs> is just hilariously sad. So I guess they did work as a villain towards their, their creators' careers. But on screen, not so much. 
Well, I was very much tied on best villain between Tobias Vaughn and the Warlord. So given that Tobias Vaughn already has two nominations, I will join Julie and nominate the Warlord, although it's pretty close to being a tie. Again, just so cool, calm, collected, so scheming. I love when he's in front of the Time Lords at trial and he basically says, I don't recognize the authority of this court. That was... Mm -hmm. Mm. badass mm -hmm. and he said that after being mentally tortured by them or psychically tortured dude i wish they yep. could bring him back but you know he's been dematerialized so never mind if he didn't die on screen it doesn't count. uh big finish yeah <laughs> <laughs> they'll find a way worst villain cavern again like riley yep. i have nothing to say wholly unmemorable much like the majority of that story so yeah no i'm good without him so we're pretty evenly split across both of those categories. For our next category, we have my personal favourite of Best Director and the Richard Martin Award for Worst Director, otherwise known as The Dickie. <laughs> so our options here, we have Morris Barry for The Dominators, David Maloney, who directed three stories in The Mind Robber, The Crotons, and The War Games. What an absolute gladiator. Douglas Camfield with The Invasion, Michael Ferguson with The Seeds of Death, and Michael Hart with The Space Pirates. So Riley, Best Director, and The Dicky. <laughs> David Maloney for The War Games, Best Director. Uh, I think Julie already hit on it. That was a massive undertaking and a huge responsibility. And he pulled it off. It's 10 episodes. I didn't feel like they dragged too much. And he had to handle the farewell of those three characters. That was amazing. And he had the responsibility of introducing Time Lords. I mean, that's just so much to do. And it works. It really works all the way through, even though it's 10 episodes. It's quite impressive. Uh, the Dickie... It always feels a little unfair to pick a worst director while we cover, while we're, you know, still on seasons of Doctor Who with missing episodes, this being our last. But in the case of the Space Pirates, screw them. I'm talking about you, Michael Hart. You gave, you gave me Milo. I give you the dicky. <laughs> Riley, you are on form tonight, my friend. Ooh, Thank you. I gave you the dicky, the Riley Shrek story. <laughs> All right, oh, Julie. Boy. All right, so I'm probably going to go a little bit off course, and one of the reasons is I'm going with Michael Ferguson with The Seeds of Death. Yes, I was the one to edit that episode. One of the things that I noticed upon re-listening to that was all of the instances where we said, oh man, that was a great shot, or you know, this was mm. really well done, this was very clever. You had that chase scene that happens on the little moon station, and they probably only had like three sets on there, but it looked like there was space, mm -hmm. because just the way that he was able to direct that, it was like, oh, they're like going in a maze, when really it's just the same corridor, just shot from a different angle. So that's why I'm going with him, and just a little bit different than what everyone else might choose. And the Dickie, I'm going to go with Morris Berry because the Dominators was just bad. And since, again, there were missing episodes for the Space Pirates, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. There could have been some really great cinematography, but Morris Berry, nope, not at all. Or Morris Barry. <laughs> no, no. No? No. Fair. I mean, did the Moon Base, the Tomb of the Side Men, and then the bloody Dominators. Uh, mm. All right, Don, you're up next. Oh, goody. I was this close to giving the best director to good old Dougie Camfield for the invasion. But mm -hmm. after giving it some thought, I'm going to have to give it to David Maloney for the mind robber, which when you get that script, how do you decide to shoot that? <laughs> that's, that's impressive. Plus the war games. And even though there's a lot of stuff I don't like about the Grotons, it's mainly because of some design things that weren't his fault. Mm -hmm. What a champ yeah. to really knock that out of the park for the Dickie. I think I'm going to have to go with Michael Hart for the Space Pirates because with the Dominators, I blame that strictly on the script. But the director could have said, hey, no comedy voices. How about you don't dress like that? All those kind of director <laughs> decisions that you should probably make when you're creating a piece of science fiction and it just doesn't work. I do wish that those lost episodes were there, but no, no, you're getting the dicky. <laughs> okay, best director. I'm going to show love to Dougie Canfield here. 
The Invasion mm-hmm. is a mammoth undertaking, so well directed. It oscillates from genre to genre, going through spy thriller. It's got elements of horror in there. It's an action movie at some times. Mm-hmm. It's just a phenomenal body of work. And the scale he gave with that, using his contacts to bring in the Ministry of Defense to provide troops as extras, genius. It is very close with David Maloney for everything Don and Riley have said, even the Crotons, where it wasn't his fault he was given zero budget for that. He did everything he could to make that good. The Mind Robber, phenomenal. The War Games, phenomenal. But I, I want to show Dougie a bit of love. In terms of the dicky, <laughs> I'm with Julie. I can't quite bring myself to give it to someone who five out of six of their episodes are missing. So I'm going to go back to Morris Barry, side with Julie yes. here. The Crotons was <laughs> just pretty terrible. So yeah. We're going with Morris. You realize that you criticized the Crotons, which David Maloney yeah, directed. Yeah, I was about to say. I, yeah. I meant the Dominators. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Morris Barry for the Dominators. There you go. My bad. Just, I don't know what got that in my head there. Okay, final category. Best and worst use of music, otherwise known as the Julies. Riley, we'll start with you. All right. The I guess the good Julie <laughs> uh, will be... There are so many good uses of music in the invasion. It's really hard to pick one. And I'm, this seems to be the, the season of ties. I will try to avoid that and I will just pick one. I will go with that jaunty little flute piece for when the unit Jeep rolls out. It is, in my heart, the unit theme song. And now for the bad Julie. This, <laughs> I would say, and this is tough because I was just praising the war games and the direction of it. It's my only problem with the war games, really is that same recurring piece of music they use. If they could have just varied up the music a little bit, but the fact that it's the same bit of music, repetitive, over and over, it just got very grating. And that is the worst use of music for me. Okay. Julie, best and worst use of music. I don't want to do a repeat, but Riley, you stole my my Uh, first one. And that was because also, remember, I watched this with captions. So the jaunty military music is what I remembered. (laughs) So what I'm going to choose is actually a, a use of stock music, and that was the dual scene in The Mind Robber. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. yes. Good. Oh, mm-hmm. it was so good. It was perfect. And even though it wasn't written for the show, it was one of those times where I was like, man, they made a good choice right there. So that was one of my favorites. And then the worst music was in The Space Pirates. I can't remember exactly what it was, but my comment was, what the hell, music? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good comment i like that so yes uh it's got to be the space pirates because that was the one that had exclamation points and question marks and was the only thing that really popped out in all my notes okay don best music i had to go with the invasion just because i remember in that first episode just how awesome it was it's setting a mood it created tension just everything you would want in a score for worst use of music, I wrote down the Dominators, and I think it's because mm-hmm. they didn't have any. <laughs> yep, they they didn't have any. I mean, uh, that was that was my next option was the Dominators just needed music. Yes, if they can't use the, the classic stock house and music, then what are you even doing? You know, come on, you've got this vast BBC library, pull something from it. But they didn't, and it made a crappy story even crappier. Yeah. So, Don, I'm actually going to agree with you on the worst use of music for that exact reason. It really could have done with something to add some tension, and it just wasn't there. And, uh, you know, you can't really polish a turd, but it might have made it a little (laughs) less stinky, maybe. I don't know. In terms of the best use of music, I love that organ crescendo at the end of episode nine of the War Games mm, as the Time Lords are coming. That is so good. It really added to the sense of menace and and the sense of the epic. And for me, it gave the impression something big is about to happen. And yeah, something big was about to happen. It just fit the part so well. So that's my best use of music. So next up, we move into some questions from Facebook. We will start with one from David Campbell. Great name. I hope you're treating Susan well, David. (laughs) (laughs) David asks, Season six was plagued by stories falling through and being abandoned, leading to some stories being extended into epics. What do the Watchers think about the idea of a Doctor Who Battle of the Sexes comedy in The Prison in Space? Does it sound preferable to its replacement, The Crotons, or just hot garbage in space? And has Julie started a letter writing campaign to get Big Finish to produce the lead of McCrimmon? Hashtag justice for Jamie. 
I actually didn't start that, but now that someone has brought it to my attention and that this campaign has not started yet, yes, um, definitely will be starting that. I think it actually would be interesting to hear more about the Laird of McCrimmon. I haven't done too much research on it, but just any more stories with Jamie would be great. And then the fact that him becoming a Laird, uh, yes, please. Uh, he definitely needs to be one of those. And you know what? If he needs a lady... We can, we can make that happen. <laughs> As for the other piece with the Battle of the Sexes, that one I knew very, very little about. So I actually did some research, heaven forbid. And while I like the idea of having a comedy, there were some issues that I found when I was reading it. And I'm not actually surprised that they decided to abandon that script, mainly because there was apparently one point, and I, it could have just been the article that I read, and maybe this was not true, but... Part of it was going to be Zoe being put into a trance, and the only way that she could get out of the trance was by a spanking. And I was like, um, no. That sounds like some sort of fan fiction. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> was that true? Because that, that wasn't an article that I read. I believe so. I don't remember whether it's in the Big Finish adaptation of The Prison in Space, which I've listened to, and I will say that's a few hours of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> yeah. Again, I think the idea of a comedy would be fun. An idea of Battle of the Sexes would be fun. But I just don't think from what I heard about plot wise, I just don't think that they did a really good job with the plot. And that's why they decided to reject it. That's fair. Yeah, it wasn't good. I'll put it like that. The, the way Big Finish did it, it's very obvious that it fell through for a reason. And I think Big Finish could have saved some time and probably saved some money in not adapting that one. Does it have any kind of humorous moments from how outrageous and sexist it is like it would be if you were watching a episode of Mad Men? You know what, dude? I don't remember because I've blocked mm. it out of my memory. I literally remember diddly squat about the Big Finish adaptation. Jamie was going to escape from prison dressed up as a dolly guard. And let me tell you, <laughs> the term dolly guard... <laughs> <laughs> makes me be really concerned. <laughs> Unless they all look like Dolly Parton, but then I might still be concerned, but it's Dolly Parton, so yeah, right. that might work. <laughs> Moving on, please. Yep. <laughs> Our next question comes from Sarah Speary, who says, In this season, we saw some great returns such as Lethbridge Stewart, the Cybermen, and the Ice Warriors. Are there any characters or monsters that you would have liked to have seen return for one more encounter with the Second Doctor before his regeneration? I say the great intelligence minus his Yeti minions. Just the great intelligence with better minions. I thought the great intelligence was a fantastic villain. It's a great premise for a villain, has a lot of potential, and would be a very good challenge for the second Doctor. I think that's a good idea. I'm glad we didn't see a return of the Daleks yet again in this season. Mm -hmm. And that when we did see the Cybermen return, at least they weren't silly and walking through space. <laughs> yeah. I almost would have liked to have seen a Dalek story with Zoe, but it may have been diminishing returns. Yeah. I would have liked if it was kind of like they've done with New Who, where it's like a single Dalek mm -hmm. and be a lot more like cerebral and not like just, oh man, it's an invasion of Daleks. It's like, no, there's mm -hmm. just one and they're interacting with that one. I think that would be interesting. But for me, what I would want, and I already mentioned it on the episode, was I want Kamel back from Evil the Daleks for my Jamie Kamel Big Finish series. <laughs> <laughs> if he came back, it's not necessarily with the second Doctor, more with Jamie, but I just think that would be fun. They're also the two characters that they met early on in the war games, Lady mm -hmm. Jennifer mm -hmm. and, and Carstairs. Yep. Yeah, and Carstairs. Yeah. I, I liked them a lot. I thought they would have potentially made a good companion pair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Would have been cool to see them exiled with the Doctor to 1970s Earth for <laughs> season seven. Out of time. All right, next up, Dave Jones asks a fairly similar question, but almost the inverse. Dave asks, what baddies from season six would have been great in stories with a different Doctor? Obviously Tobias Vaughn, because yes. he's awesome. And I would, and this is just me being selfish, aside from, you know, the Warlords and stuff like that. Any kind of return to maybe a little bit of the land of fiction in some way? Mm -hmm. It would probably ruin it by going back to that particular well, but it's so unique and interesting, and I would have liked to have seen another Doctor, like maybe even four, handle that. I think it would be fun. Big Finish did a trilogy with the sixth Doctor in the Land of Fiction, and they put a different spin on it, and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. So good call. Mm -hmm. I viewed this question as thinking about the Doctors we've already seen, which we've only seen two, 
on our watch right now, and then doctors outside of that watch. And when I thought about that, I don't know why, maybe, Don, maybe you will agree with me on this, maybe it's because of the wacky design, but the first doctor facing off against the Crotons just looks right. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know why, but I just, I have that image in my head that just feels right. And the other would be, and as Don mentioned, Tobias Vaughn is just so great. I think I'd like to see him in the 12th Doctor because I could just see a wonderful scene where the 12th Doctor is giving this emotionally moving monologue to Vaughn and for Vaughn to just coldly deny him would just be an excellent (laughs) dramatic scene. Yeah, yeah. I think I would love to see either Vaughn or the Warlord. So the two kind of coldest, most calculating Mm -hmm. up against the seventh Doctor, who's probably the most manipulative of the Doctors. That would have turned into like a huge game of chess between them. And I think that could be rather fun. Yeah. And I'm going to go completely off the wall here. And I want to see the 10th Doctor with the quarks. (laughs) <laughs> because <laughs> I think Shooting it would be overload. hilarious, oh. and oh. you can just see David Tennant just like fawning over them. Yeah, so controversial right there, but um, and, and the quirk's not necessarily in a bad guy capacity. Honestly, it's just as as a quirk capacity. That's it. Mm-hmm. I would like to sit in a comedy scene with a quirk <laughs> as like the bar robot, you know, <laughs> serving up drinks. <laughs> Yes. All right. Next question comes from Stu Gutteridge, who asks, when are you going to rewatch the Space Pirates? You shut your mouth, Stu. You <laughs> shut it. Just kidding. Just kidding, Stu. Just kidding. I got a line here. So it's either never or in eight years when we reflect back on Classic Who and say it couldn't have been that bad or <laughs> if it ever gets found in its entirety or if Fraser Hines personally asks me to rewatch it. That's a lot of answers. I was just going to say, if they find it and it's complete, or even if they just find a missing episode, I'll I'll watch that. Yeah, that's fair. If they find it, I'll watch it. If they find it all. You know. <laughs> I will watch it either when they find it or when they animate it. One of those two. Also fair. Yeah. Okay, next up, we have Mark Heffernan, who asks, This season features two longer stories in the shape of The Invasion and The War Games. How do these longer form stories hold up, especially in comparison to the first Doctor's Dalek master plan? Really, really well. Yes. (laughs) Generally, I'm not a fan of the super long stories because it's usually just padding. In both these cases, these are really good stories and they hold up. Yep. I completely agree. I find it better than the Daleks master plan predominantly because you don't have a random holiday episode that was thrown (laughs) in and you don't have three or four episodes, which was literally them just hopping from place to place with no actual plot Mm -hmm. being driven. On the other hand, these two stories do have a startling lack of evil Christmas trees. (laughs) So I am going to have to remove points for that. Yes. And I wonder if they knew that they had nailed it. And that's why the first season of the third doctor has three seven points. <gasps> hey, you guys went at the prospect of an eight-parter and a ten-parter in this season, and you really enjoyed them both, so let's not prejudge we season seven. We will continue to whenever we feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think, Mark, we answered your question. Next up, our final question comes once again from David Campbell. He says, obviously, all three regulars leave in the war games, but there was an idea that Wendy Padbury could stay on for Pertwee's first season, where the Brigadier and unit provided some continuity for the new era. So, what other characters from the Troughton era would the Watchers have enjoyed seeing when the Doctor commences his exile on Earth? And he provides some suggestions. Isabel Watkins and Captain Jimmy, Professor Travers and or Anne Travers, Professor Watkins, and maybe even Victoria, or perhaps some other non-contemporary Earth character misplaced in time, Cough, Carstairs and Lady Jennifer, and also Becoming Stranded. And he also asks, if Wendy Pabry had stayed on, how would you have written the trial scenes to explain why Jamie had to go, but Zoe could stay with the Doctor? That part's easy. Zoe was too smart and couldn't be brainwashed or wiped by the Time Lords, and so they decided to send her along with the Doctor. Well, it is interesting that you say that, because there was actually an instance where Jamie was resisting being brainwashed more so than the other companions. So, Mm -hmm. interesting point. But I also think it's more based on her intelligence. I think that she's just so smart that they wouldn't want to necessarily wipe that away um, and think that she could probably do the doctor some good. 
Maybe it's the RTD in me. I went full, crazy, overly dramatic, like teary-eyed. I would have to say that the Time Wars decided that Zoe has to say stay because the wheel in space eventually did get blown up like right after they left. And then <laughs> Jamie has to go back to Scotland because as a person from, from history, his death has already been written. He's supposed to die on a battlefield in Scotland. Oh, no. <laughs> Why do you hate Julie? That's awful. <laughs> Which was always my reasoning of why I hated the fact that they dropped him back off right after the Battle of Culloden. I'm like, yeah, you just wished him to death. Okay, thanks, Time Lords. You guys are great. <laughs> you know, I'm with Don. She's too smart. Their memory wipe wouldn't work on her, so they just send her off with him. And then, you know, she can probably fall in love with someone in 20th century Earth when she decides to eventually leave. You know, that old cliche. Mm-hmm. is kind of how that works. Mm-hmm. In terms of the first question, though, I mean, I genuinely do think it would be fun to have Carstairs and Lady Jennifer in 1970s Earth being like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Maybe Carstairs could even join UNIT. Who knows? Well, I mean, I mentioned that before, but I also think they mentioned Professor Travers and and his daughter. And I kind of like that. I like the idea of the professor being inspired by the doctor and just goes out in search of weird stuff. Yeah. You stole my answer. That's what I was going to go with. But I was also going to say that I would only want that if that was without Zoe. But if it mm. was with Zoe, I think I'd want it with Isabel and yeah. Captain Jimmy. Because I liked the energy, that young like female energy between Isabel and Zoe. And I think that would have been very interesting for the Doctor to have to like keep up with them. Yeah. And I went kind of a little bit more realistic. I liked Isabel and Captain Jimmy well enough and keeping Captain Jimmy in unit and interacting with all of them since I know Lethbridge Stewart continues his little run. I think it would have made sense. And, you know, maybe Isabel could actually learn how to take pictures. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) We can see her progress as an artist. Okay, so David had our last question from Facebook. That's more than we've ever had before. So we'll be doing this again next time at the end of season seven. But in the meantime, let's look at our final metrics count. And we've slacked (laughs) off a little on the camp count. So we only had a total camp count for season six of six. That's not too bad. I wasn't seeing a lot of camp this season. No, Mm -hmm. just to put that in perspective, season three had a total camp count of (laughs) 37.5. Wow. Oh, wow. So, you know, less than a sixth of the camp this season. (laughs) Is that on the cover of the disc of the, of the box set? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be. In terms of the I'll Explain Later count, zilch. And we had four more quarries this season. So that took our total series quarry count or quarry query from five to nine. Cool, those quarry lovers are getting really Incredible. excited yeah. where we're going. Coming oh, up. yes. <laughs> We've got some hot quarry action coming up soon. I think in retrospect, we should have done a count of how many times Zoe changes outfits. Yes. Uh, I don't think yeah. we've ever seen a companion change clothes so often. Yeah. So yeah. far. So far. We also should have had a count for how many times people didn't listen to Jamie. Or the shut up Jamie count, <laughs> which I kind of yeah. started for a while, but the numbers were overwhelming. <laughs> Okay, very quickly before we wrap up, let's look at our final scores. Don, your highest rated was the Mind Robber, 9.5. You put the Dominators and the Space ru- uh, space Pirates on a tie at lowest at 1.5. You almost said the Space Rubbish. I want to point that out. <laughs> I we did. all heard you. I did. <laughs> Just to put that in perspective, your next worst was the Crotons with five points. So you had a season six average of 5.93. Julie, your best was the War Games, 9 points, followed by the Mind Rubber, 8.5. And your worst was the Space Pirates, 1.5, followed by the Dominators at 2. Mm-hmm. And you had a Season 6 average of 6.14. I beat Don. <laughs> <laughs> Riley, your mm-hmm. favorite was the Mind Rubber, 9 points, followed by the War Games with 8. And then your least favorite, the Space Pirates, with 1.5, followed by the Dominators with 4. You had a Season 6 average of 5.93, so you're in line with Don. Yeah. And then finally, I was the one who really loved Season 6, or at least I loved the highs a lot more. I gave the Mind Robber 10 points. Holy crap. Followed by the Invasion and the War Games on a tie with 9 points each. My least favorite, Space Pirates, 1.5, followed by the Dominators with 2. My Season 6 total, or average, I should say, was 6. 6.43. Add all those averages together, we gave the season 6.11 as an average, which makes it actually, based on our averages, the weakest season to date. It's it's only oh. the weak stories. The great stories yeah. are really, really good. And this is why yeah. the numbers don't matter. <laughs> now that we've wasted five minutes of your life talking about them, they don't matter. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you take out the space pirates and the dominators, that whole thing shifts drastically. Yeah, yeah. quite radically. Swings and roundabouts. Well, that actually brings us to the end of our episode. This is where we would normally do the mail, but we've done it already. Hope you enjoyed. We will be back next time for yet another retrospective episode, if this wasn't enough for you, where we will be back with friend of the podcast, Alan Seiler, who will be joining us to moderate our full Troughton era retrospective. So we'll be looking at seasons four, five and six there. So we hope you'll join us again for that. But for now, as always, thank you very much for listening and have a good one. You have been listening to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension with Don Smith, Riley Shrek, Julie Philippak, and myself, Anthony Williams. This episode, Hot Space Garbage, was recorded on Wednesday the 12th of May 2021. If this is your first time listening in, all of our previous episodes are available on your favourite podcasting app. You can interact with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at at Watchers4D. And you can also email us at Watchers4D at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and leave us a review or rating on your favorite podcasting app. All three of these things really do help the show. And always remember, we watch the Space Pirates so that you don't have to.